Who Killed Julie is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is highly advised. This episode of Who Killed Julie is brought to you by my new book, Novel Idea to Podcast, How to Sell More Books Through Podcasting. Available on Amazon now. Sometimes, she's the best thing to happen to me. Sometimes, she's the worst. I love her and hate her, all in the same breath. What is that? Why do I feel like that about her? She's my best goddamn friend and my worst enemy. Well, that's not true. There's always mom. Julie's Journal, May 25th. 2012. Sometimes someone will say something so strange it catches you off guard, and it isn't until much later you realize the significance of their words. Maybe it's an oddball statement that just didn't fit the context of the moment, or maybe it's a strange comment you literally couldn't make heads or tails of then and there, but when you reflect back on it, you got it. You understood what they meant, and where they were coming from. The true meaning came through. That's what it was like when I sat in a booth in the middle of a hotel bar, an expensive hotel, by the way, and watched Caleb Haskins crumble in front of me over the loss of the woman he loved. One minute I was trying to figure out his angle, and the next he was telling me he'd killed Julie. People will say the craziest things when their emotional triggers are pulled. You've probably seen that in your own life, I imagine. An argument with a loved one, the coworker or friend who hit you right in the middle of your vulnerabilities and you reacted without thinking. We've all done it. We've all been there. It's part of the human condition. We're vulnerable and imperfect creatures, just like Caleb, who finally dropped that facade and became one in front of me. This is the story of Julie. This is the story of all of us and the masks we wear to protect ourselves from the rest of the world. I am Emerald Johnson, and you're listening to Who Killed Julie. Caleb didn't kill Julie. I knew that then. Roderick Alba had. At least, that's what I believed at the time, even though Walter, Julie's father, thought differently. Roderick was tried and convicted and later hanged himself in his prison cell at the Federal Detention Center in SeaTac. An inglorious death, to be sure, but one that put the mystery to bed for that part of Julie's story. In part, at least, because Roderick never told anyone about his motivation for doing what he did, why he decided to take someone's life if he took someone's life. (laughs) I know, I promise, you'll understand why I say that before all of this is done. Julie was a person who lived a regular life, doing the same things the rest of us do, day in and day out, wondering if the cycle of monotony would ever end. We try to carry on. We try to convince ourselves that things will get better one day, that everything we've scrimped and saved for, everything we've sacrificed happiness for, will one day pay off. But the reality is that it doesn't. Not for most of us. We simply grow. We grow older, more tired, jaded. We give up on those dreams of our younger selves. Little by little and one by one, they fade into obscurity. And one day, it all clicks. We realize that this is what life is and all it will ever be. We concede and life wins because we never do. Roderick wasn't a winner. Caleb wasn't either. In that hotel, he became a shell of the super aggressive macho asshole I'd met in his apartment. Exposing his true self to me briefly but true just the same. 
Angela wasn't a winner, and Walter, sweet as he was, lost the only thing he loved, the only reason to wake each and every day, dooming him to live out the rest of his life with a void that could never be filled. No one gets out of this game on the riser. We don't hold the trophy above our heads as shouts and cries of adulation rain down upon us. Life isn't like that. Not for anyone. Those happy people you see walking around the lake outside the Capitol building in Olympia, their happiness is momentary, fleeting. Right now, they're simply enjoying the peace they have with the loved ones they're with. Be that other people or the thousands of dogs that seem to be taking the city over. But they, too, are struggling. With bills, with heartache, with the fact that each day they're alive, they're actually getting closer to dying. It's the cycle of the struggle, and it's the one thing all of us have in common. After everything this investigation taught me about Julie, the more I think about her life, the more comfortable I am describing her as a beautiful tragedy. That's exactly what she was, in so many ways. I want to return to my talk with Caleb in a minute. We didn't get to finish that night. He was too distraught. I basically spent my night trying to console him and protect his public image. A grown man sobbing like that in a hotel has a tendency to upset and disturb people. It's a reminder of just how fragile we are. So suffice it to say, I didn't keep digging into his motivations for saying what he did. I was simply trying to be a decent human being. Instead, I want to visit a conversation I had with Rachel Leonard. You'll remember her as Julie's best friend. From everything I learned talking to Caleb and from Julie's own words in her journal, there were issues and events I wanted to get another perspective on. And Rachel was that person to give it to me. So when I got back to Olympia, got unpacked and settled in again, I gave her a call. She was as easy to talk to as ever. I thought you were done with me. Oh yeah? Why? Hadn't heard from you in a few days, so I figured you got everything you needed. I've been tied up with Angela and Caleb. Oh. How'd that go? Can't say I got everything I wanted, but I did get a lot of information. Yeah, well, you're going to definitely get that from those two. Lots of information, about half of it useful. You know, anytime you're willing, you could help fill in the holes for me. Especially since there seems to be some sort of hostility you hold for them. Be my guest. I'm all ears. But there's no hostility. I just can't stand them. <laughs> okay, then. Any reason why? Well, any reason that pertains to Julie's story. I'm not interested in hearing any beef you have with them outside that. Aw. You don't want to hear about all my drama? <laughs> I don't blame you. Between my kids and my husband and this goddamn job, I've got enough stress and drama to tie you up for the next few days. Trust me, you don't need to hear my drama. Yeah, it has to do with Julie. Who would you like me to start with first? That piece of shit she was infatuated with or the one who screwed up her head real bad? They're both equally evil in my book, so you've got your pick. I'd rather not spend whatever time I get with you exploring your distaste for Angela and Caleb, but I would like to know how they hurt Julie. Because, I mean, that's what we're really doing here, right? That's what this is all about? Don't push me, Emerald. I've hung up on you before. I'll do it again. And this time, I won't pick up the next call. I can always swing by your work, and we can chat there if that works better for you. Are you seriously trying to fucking threaten me? I've got a story to tell, Rachel. Why can't you just be upfront and honest about Julie's life? Why do I have to constantly dig for information from you? Because there's shit you don't need to know. There's stuff about Julie no one needs to know. Least of all some hick in Louisiana who's going to accidentally download your damn podcast thinking she's going to get some juicy true TV crime shit, okay? Okay? 
That's fucking why. Listen. I'm sorry, Rachel. I am. I'm sorry for what happened to Julie. And I'm sorry you lost a dear friend. I cannot imagine what she went through, and I'm not going to try to fool you into thinking I can. I didn't live her experience. None of us did. But you're the closest one to it. You're the one who can make a true difference in how her story is told. You've got to know that. I know you do. All I can do is ask for your cooperation. <sighs> My intentions are pure. Hell, I'll let you listen to everything, read everything before anyone ever hears this. Whatever it takes for you to be real with me, I'll do it. Hmm. Whatever, huh? If I can, yes. Then I want you to understand something very clearly, Emerald. Okay. This shit you're digging into involves other people. People you don't want to be fucking around with. Wait. What? <laughs> you, you think you've got the real story? The full story? <laughs> From who? Julie's parents and Caleb? Please! And you sure as hell can't talk to Roderick now, can you? I guess you could swing by that upscale prison and speak to Stanford, but he wouldn't give up shit, not to someone like you. You're not connected enough. So far, into creating this, this story of Julie, and you still don't know shit. And you keep coming back to me like I'm going to hand over the Holy Grail. You know, I got a husband and kids who I love and cherish, and talking to you doesn't do anything for them. Or me. But it does. For Julie. And what about Stanford Wilson? So fucking what? What? What does this do for Julie? She is rotting in the ground. Fuck. She rotted before they even put her in the ground. That's the reality of this emerald. She was beaten, strangled, and dumped in some goddamn bay. And no one cared, Emerald. No one fucking cared. <laughs> Sorry. But please, don't come at me with platitudes. I'm all out of fucks to give. No, it's okay. I'm sorry, Rachel. I truly am. I've I've been callous and careless. And I let my frustrations blind me. There are still people behind all of this. I'm sorry if I haven't shown that so far. I haven't been fair. You deserve better. Don't worry about me. I'm a big girl. Julie deserved better. A lot better than she got from just about everyone in her life except those little boys. Ryan and Kyle were her everything. And it's really sad that Kyle will never truly know who she was. Ryan might have some memories, but they'll be from the young boy's mind. He won't know what she was really like and all the stuff she did so those boys had the best life she could give them. That's probably the truest tragedy here, Emerald. And now they're off with a horrible excuse for a sperm donor and the person who gave them everything who would do anything for them is gone. And the thing is, the thing that tears at my soul when those boys are grown up and have their own lives, their own families, she won't be a part of that. Not even in memory. But this podcast will be out there. This thing you're doing is going to live forever, and I can't stop it. And that fucking kills me. The podcast is going to be a problem? Please, tell me why, Rachel. 
I was hired to tell a positive story about who she was, not demonize her. I'm going to be fair, I promise, but if there's something more to this you feel I need to know, I'd like to hear it. I've been trying to drop hints all along, but you don't seem interested in picking them up. There are obvious reasons why people aren't being upfront with you about Julie, and if those secrets come out, if the world hears why everyone is being so hush-hush about her story, those two little boys will someday be grown men, and you, this podcast, might be the very reason they end up hating her. Help me change that, then. What did Caleb tell you about them? About him and Julie? What did he say? Well, now I know he was in love with Julie basically right up until the day she disappeared. That they dated during and after college, and that they hid it from Julie's parents. No. Just Angela. Walter knew? Yep. Julie told him everything. And, well, Angela? It's not like she hated her mother. Julie wasn't like that. But she wasn't as concerned with protecting Angela's feelings as she was with Walter. She really loved him, and he really loved her. (laughs) Daddy's girl kind of shit. It's a shame Angela did all she could to drive a wedge between them, but, you know, you reap what you sow and all that. Angela was basically left out because of how she treated Julie. As Julie matured... She started seeing through the veil Angela created. I blame Angela for a lot of the stuff Julie went through. What do you mean? Don't get me wrong. Julie loved Caleb. She really did. I don't doubt that for a second, but Julie was reckless, Emerald. Reckless. If I was there with her, a lot of the shit she did wouldn't have been done. Promise you that. Like what? Like dating her rapist. So, Caleb did assault her? You know that for a fact? Rape, not another form of sexual assault. You know he raped her. Because I've got conflicting information. Yes, and that son of a bitch had better have been honest about it with you. We didn't really get a chance to get to that. Of course not. No, he'd do anything to avoid talking about that, wouldn't he? I get that he's ashamed of what he did, and he should be. But to still be denying or avoiding it is pathetic, you know? Be a damn grown-ass man and own up to what you did. But he doesn't. Obviously. Maybe he didn't realize what he did, Rachel. Uh, Do you think he could honestly be clueless about how Julie felt about what happened? That's not abnormal. Are you serious? Seriously saying he might not know that he raped her? Look, I'm not trying to defend anyone. I'm exploring the story. We weren't there, so we don't know what happened. Sexual assault is a tricky thing. You don't need to tell me. I'm a survivor myself. I'm sorry that happened to you. What about you? Have you ever been assaulted? Yes. When I was in high school. Did it change you? Yes. Yes, it did. I've become a lot more outspoken about it, and I've done a lot of research into it, and even still volunteer a few hours a month at the local crisis center in Olympia. It took a lot of work on my part, but I've grown. I'm a survivor. Look. The last thing I'm trying to do is make light of what Julie went through. But I do feel okay about looking at these situations as free from bias as I can, because I've been there myself and talked to hundreds of women who feel they were assaulted. Sexual assault can be a dangerous topic for everyone. It's not as black and white as Hollywood wants us to think it is. So me asking about Caleb possibly not knowing, it comes from my personal experience and the collective experience of all those women I've spent thousands of hours with. Sometimes the people who assault someone don't even realize what they've done.
Maybe that's Caleb. Do you know if Julie ever talked to him about it? I don't know, to be honest. I don't know if she could have. I know I sure as hell never confronted the asshole who assaulted me. Maybe she did, and that's why they were able to date, because... (laughs) Oh, I could never wrap my head around why she even started dating him. Never mind why she stayed with him. Did she seem happy? Yeah. Yeah. I think he made her happy. Then isn't that what counts? Who knows? Maybe he did assault her and made penance. And you know, honestly, if we don't know, then how can we judge their relationship? Yeah, I guess. They dated throughout his last two years there. Well, yeah. I mean, they met in the fall of her freshman year. She hadn't been there long, so it had to be maybe even November by then. So he had, what, a year and a half left before he graduated? They didn't start dating right away either, so my guess is just a little over a year. But (laughs) they had to be one of those sickening couples for everyone in their circles because they were always around each other. And the way she talked about him? Ugh. (laughs) Just gross. So you're not into the whole passionate love stuff then? I wish I could convince myself that's what it was. How so? She was so sheltered by her mother that I think Caleb was her break, if you know what I mean. I think. <laughs> she was uh, <laughs> ignorant about life, like everything about being an adult. That's why she went to Syracuse. Actually, now that I think about it, almost all the schools she applied to were out east. She only applied to a few Washington schools to keep Angela off her ass. But it wasn't like she really intended on going to any of them. If she was accepted by any school out east, she was gone. I knew that. I think Walter did, too. But not Angela? Nope. Totally in the dark. Just the way Julie wanted her. Why? She was fucking suffocated by that woman. Julie looked forward to college to get away from it. I mean, she was a dork anyways, always studying, doing extracurricular stuff and whatnot, but I think she pushed herself so hard because she knew it was her ticket out. Even when we were younger, she was that focused, thinking far ahead. That's how smart she was. Yet, she moved back here afterwards. Why? Who knows? She missed this place, she missed Caleb. Or maybe she just... Needed friendly faces around because of what happened. I was just glad to have her home. I know that was pretty selfish. But she seemed happy about coming home. And seriously, she wasn't the same person as when she left, so I thought part of her returning was because she knew she could deal with Angela by that time in her life. But didn't she and Caleb move apart after he graduated? He moved back west. She was in New York. I haven't gotten through all of her journal yet, but I know that she Can wrote. Did you journal? Yes. You didn't know that? No. How'd you get it? Walter gave it to me. Wanted me to see it. He said no one else knew about it, not even Angela, but I figured Julie would have said something to you at least. He just gave it to you? What's in it? I haven't finished reading it. Did she journalize everything? Everything at Syracuse? Like I said, I don't know. I'm still reading it. She wrote about it, yes, but I still don't know what everything is, so I can't answer that. (sighs) Um, The reason Julie moved back here, the real reason she moved back here, wasn't just because she was in love with Caleb or missed her family. What was it then? What drove her back into the arms of the people she'd spent her entire life up to that point trying to escape? Because that's still not making sense to me. Well, I'm sure you're going to read about it anyways if her journal is half as detailed as her notes and the emails she used to write to me. Oh, God, I can't believe she kept a damn journal and I didn't know about it. But listen... If you're going to read it anyways, let me prepare you. Save you some time. Maybe it'll help you work through all this shit quicker so the rest of us can get on with our lives, but... (sighs) 
Julie wasn't assaulted just once while she was at school. She was raped at least three times that I know of. And, um, and she got pregnant from one of them. Throughout this series of Who Killed Julie, we will be partnering with Safe Place in Olympia, Washington to raise funds for their operations. Safe Place provides crucial services to survivors of domestic and sexual violence. They offer a 24-hour helpline, 24-hour emergency shelter and sexual assault response, advocacy support groups, legal clinics, children and youth programs, prevention education, community outreach, and training. Please see the donation link in the episode notes. Help us raise as much as we possibly can for Safe Place in Olympia, Washington to serve people who need them now. Today, Olympia, Washington. Tomorrow, your city. Let's change the world. People are imperfect creatures. We all have blemishes that we disguise so the rest of the world can't see them. We cover them with makeup, we hide them behind a smile, or we distract the observing world with our other, more glorified attributes, like our work ethic, our personality, or our selfless giving. We shelter ourselves in ways that allow us to keep those blemishes undiscovered, undiscoverable, so that we can survive. Julie had her blemishes. After my conversation with Rachel, I went back to Julie's journal and skimmed through it. Thankfully, it's a chronological journal and she was meticulous, if not incredibly organized. I didn't know exactly what date I was looking for, but Rachel gave me enough information to narrow my search. Julie's entries were full of deep introspection. One thing I've learned about her since Walter gave me the journal was that she was a complex person who struggled with self-loathing I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. Here, look at this one example. She wrote, Why'd I do that? Why in the world do I do that? I'm so goddamn stupid. It's pathetic. Everything I touch turns to ashes. I'm a fire. I destroy. She hated herself. She had for years. Julie actually started journaling at Syracuse. She was lonely, scared, trying to cope with a new life that was so, so different from the only one she knew up until that time. It makes sense. She spent her formative years understanding the world one way, Angela's way, only to find herself 3,000 miles away, free from the shackles that had been placed on her. It must have felt like a completely different world to her. Grounding, centering herself by journaling, it's remarkably mature for someone so young, with so much going on. Her entries started before her first assault. I know that because she wrote it all down. Every day she entered something, even if nothing of significance happened. I know that because Julie said so. She'd show her youthfulness with witty entries like, This place sucks. That's all I've got for today. New day. Same shit. Or, guess what? Nothing happened today. <laughs> Those were from her first few weeks at school. She was alone and adjusting, and she was young. Julie graduated high school at 17, so no offense to anyone listening who's younger, but we're talking about a kid here. She didn't even turn 18 until after she was already taking classes. It makes sense that someone in that situation would write stuff like this. It also gives context to what came later, after the assaults. What happened with Caleb must have been a whirlwind of confusion for Julie. That's what came through in her writing. She was all over the place. She hated him. She hated herself. She loved him. She still hated herself. 
rage, pain, hurt, adoration. It was all there in the span of a few weeks, slowly giving way to clarity. I wouldn't say she became strong, not by a long shot, but she was determined to talk to him about what happened. Unfortunately, though, I didn't find anything definitive that told me if she did or not. Before we go on, though, I need to tell you what actually happened. Not because I want to reveal dark details of Julie's life, but because, like I've said throughout this series, sexual assault is a complex issue, something a lot of people don't understand. It engages strong reactions for a plethora of reasons. As a survivor myself, I have to be sensitive to that. When people hear sexual assault, many of them think of rape. Rape is sexual assault, yes, but the term itself, sexual assault, is a spectrum. What happened between Caleb and Julie was sexual assault, but it wasn't rape. Being as clear as I possibly can be, Caleb didn't rape her. From Julie's own journal, we can know that, putting a close to any arguments, regardless of who they come from, that she was raped by Caleb. I'm about to explain what happened, because it's important to the story. It will be in good taste, but if you don't wish to hear the details of the assault, I urge you to skip ahead. Now, I'm not excusing him for what happened but it's a level of detail that is vitally important to address. It wasn't at the party where Julie met Caleb. It was weeks later and they were already going out. They had been for a few weeks when they went to a frat house party together. They were both drunk. Things progressed as things often do between people who are attracted to each other and they were soon looking for isolated parts of the house to enjoy some more intimate time. Kissing and heavy petting turned into groping. Caleb's groping of her made Julie uncomfortable, but she didn't say anything to him. She couldn't. I've seen it a thousand times, lived through it myself, and it still never gets easier. I get it. I get why she wrote what she wrote. Just let me read it to you. I didn't know what to do. Why was he still touching me like that? Everyone could see. I told him to stop touching me, but he just kept rubbing. I felt so dirty, so worthless. Why, Caleb? Why? I didn't deserve that. I didn't deserve to be treated, touched, fucking molested like that. Caleb was drunk. She was drunk. Julie wanted to kiss and touch up to a point, and then she didn't want it anymore. She was aware of where they were. She felt on display, and she didn't like that and wanted it to stop. Caleb continued to touch and fondle her even when she tried to cover herself. It should have been all the signal he needed to stop, but he didn't. He kept going until Julie stopped kissing him and asked if he'd get another beer with her. She didn't want one, of course. She just wanted to get away. She wrote, You put me on fucking display. Like I was some goddamn slut you didn't care about, Caleb. That cut me deeply. Why would you do that to me? Nothing further happened that night or after. It was a one-time mistake, bad judgment, lack of wherewithal, whatever you want to call it. But Caleb definitely wasn't guilty of things people like Walter and Rachel had been claiming all throughout my investigation. He isn't without fault. I'm not saying that. But he didn't rape Julie. 
others are responsible for that. It could be a lack of understanding or a desire to not understand on the part of Walter and Rachel, but regardless, Caleb didn't do as they'd claimed. And that's the end of that. Their relationship recovered from that night. Julie felt something for him she'd never felt for anyone else. She was deeply in love. For someone so driven and mature, her journals from that time read more like that of a teenager experiencing love for the first time. <laughs> I have to remember that she was a teenager. And I can't lie, it probably was more than a little annoying to see them out and about together. Talk about puppy love. All Caleb, all day, 24-7. I had to scan for the later assaults Rachel mentioned. But they were there. They happened after Caleb graduated, after he was already living in Fresno. Julie was a junior herself by then, and she struggled almost immediately after coming back from summer break without him around. When throwing herself into her studies didn't fill the void left by his graduation, she started looking for something else. From what I can tell, she was slightly isolated by this point. That big, anonymous campus probably didn't help. Most of her circles were Caleb and their mutual friends. Julie fell away from many of her own classmates, so when she suddenly came back for her junior year, she also found herself suddenly alone again. And when schoolwork didn't replace Caleb, other people did. And before she was a senior, Julie had been raped twice. The details, what she could write about at least, are bad enough. The stuff she might have left out, well, I'm, I'm not really interested in reading them. These betrayals of her trust are disgusting enough. The latter of those two assaults led to a pregnancy. The, what that young woman went through. She was so distraught, lost, alone, spiraling. For anyone who doesn't understand, this was a young woman, still shy of 20, who simply wasn't prepared for the world. She'd been trained her entire life to think that premarital sex was wrong, like hellfire and brimstone kind of wrong. And here she was, pregnant from an assault. Julie found herself in the unsavory position of being an involuntary sinner. Raped and pregnant, now facing the heartbreaking decision of whether or not to keep the child. Something that was unthinkable to the girl who left Washington State for Syracuse, New York, just a few short years before. On more than a few occasions, I ran across entries in her journal where Julie referred to herself as a demon. A demon. Who does that? Who says that about themselves? The conflict and turmoil, the agonizing decision she was forced into, having to make it alone. In the end, Julie wrote that it was the most difficult, painful decision she ever had to make. But she chose an abortion because she felt that was the right thing to do. There was an RA at the school who she confided in who helped her figure it out, and Julie was grateful. But it didn't end there for her, of course. For anyone who has been fortunate enough to never find themselves in that position, you may not be able to empathize with what Julie went through. Some people may not even care to, which is a shame. When women go through this, when they have to make a decision to keep a child or not, Wanted or unwanted, the agony doesn't end with the final decision. I think that's important to highlight if I'm going to be faithful to Julie's story. I didn't know her, but I know stories like hers. And when stuff like this happens, the assaults aside, you can't overlook the impact these life-altering decisions have made on these women. I don't care what your particular moral arguments are, I'm only interested in telling Julie's story 
And if you care to understand who she is, then you have to acknowledge this part too. A part you may personally be uncomfortable thinking about. But that doesn't change the fact that this is part of Julie's story, a part of what made her who she was, and a part that contributed to her decisions later in life. Why are you bringing this up? Why didn't you tell me? Because it... Julie wouldn't have wanted it that way. She wouldn't want anyone to know. Is that what you're saying? Of course not. But it's part of who she was. Part of her story. I don't give a fuck about that, Emerald. I loved her. She was a beautiful person. I mean, in a meaningful way. The world needs more people like Julie. That's the story I want you to tell about her. I'm trying, Caleb. I hope you can see that. What happened to her at school, the pregnancy, the fact that she was still able to get through that last bit of her junior year and graduate a year later, moving on with her life without help from anyone? You don't think that paints a picture of who she was? That honors her memory? I guess. I'm just not thrilled to be talking about it. And I'm not interested in leaving out important parts of her life. Listen, Caleb, I promise I'll be very tasteful in how it's presented. Okay? Yeah, fine. Something tells me you're not being straight up with me. Gee, how'd you guess? Call it woman's intuition? Just please do that for her. She deserves that much. I promise. Thank you. Did she talk to you about it? The pregnancy? Yes. Not then. Not until, uh, I don't know, we'd been, um... Having an affair? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, for a little while. So maybe it was, uh, a few years later? So you were already married at the time. Look, I'm just trying to establish the timeline here. Not air your business. You're not, huh? Well, you know, that's good to hear. Maybe just a little. Ah, fuck. Does it matter at this point if it was or not? My marriage is over, and there's no chance in saving it. I don't ever get to see the kids. I think they hate me. I've been honest with Stacy. She knows what happened, so fuck it, right? I'm sorry, Caleb. Don't be, please. You're not the one who made all the stupid choices. I did. You know, sometimes I just... Wished I'd waited. For? For Julie. I couldn't wait to get the fuck out of New York and back west. The East Coast is... It's different. Everyone seems so pissed off all the time. Rudest fucking people I've ever met. Anyways, I... I was in such a hurry to move on. She was 3,000 miles away. We loved each other so much. Even though she was two years younger, she was so much more mature than her age. So much more mature than me. The full package. The maturity of a 35-year-old in the smoking hot bod of a... A 19-year-old? Well, yeah, but it it, it sounds weird saying that now all these years later. I get your point, though. But but she knew. She fucking knew we couldn't do it. Even then, she understood long-distance relationships don't work, at least not for people like us. We're we're passionate people, a couple of idiots who just love living life, and and it's it's hard to do that alone. At, At least it was for me. So you were the first one to move on. Julie remained faithful? Yeah, that stuff that happened to her, you know, later, like, like I said, we're both passionate, but Julie wasn't like that. She would have waited forever for me to get my head straight and dedicate myself. I mean, I don't want to sound like I was out running around with any woman who'd give me time. I I wasn't, but I didn't waste time dating either. I didn't like being alone. And well, I was young and... (laughs) Okay. And Julie, no relationships that you know of? Not that I know of. And you don't think she would have hidden that from you? If she'd been dating someone back at Syracuse? You know, I I honestly don't know. I really don't. I'm telling you, she was different. 
She would have waited, but I made it abundantly clear that I'd moved on, because I'm a guy. And, you know, it's not like I threw it in her face or anything, but... You didn't hide the fact that you were with someone else and enjoying it. Yeah, I was such a dick about it. <laughs> like I had some prized thing waving it around, like I'd won the keys to the mansion or something. And, and she was so good about it. Always congratulating me, telling me she was happy for me. Never once did she lash out, not in pain or heartbreak or even jealousy. She just rolled with the punches. She always did that. Julie, she just... That woman, she was amazing. No one deserved her attention, least of all me. I'm sure you weren't that bad. And I'm sure I wasn't all that good, either. Seriously, Miss Johnson, maybe you had to know her to get it, but Julie was one of a kind. The type of woman you treasured and just counted your lucky stars or thank God or if you're into that kind of shit. People like her, they don't come around that often. And if I was just a little damn smarter, I would have recognized it. I didn't give her the time she deserved, nor the energy. I didn't put in half the effort she did. She was more than any one man could handle or even deserved to be allowed to try. I sure didn't. So what happened then? Between you two. You moved on with your life. Julie was back east. Did you both fade away or keep in touch? Fill me in. We did fade for a little while. Who doesn't at that age? Remember, I was the dick who thought he had all his shit together. I had my first real job, a degree, my own place. I was moving full steam ahead, and Julie was just the kid who was still in college. She still wrote. She called. I did too, but a lot less than her. Then, I don't know, it seemed like one day it all just stopped. I don't even remember when it happened or even what made me think about it, but I just realized she hadn't called or written for a while that she was gone. Who could blame her? I never made the first move. And even when we were catching up, it wasn't like it was exciting anymore. It was a chore. I remember that. Couldn't stand being on the phone as it was, but with your ex-girlfriend, who was an entire country away, still doing kid stuff, while I was out in the big bad world thinking I was making something of myself, I was... Justified, right? <laughs> Man, I feel really bad about this. This, 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 this is the kind of shit you need to capture if you really want to tell her story. Because this is the stuff Julie was made of that no one will talk about because it's not sexy enough. But she was patient and forgiving. You could shit on her and she'd apologize to you. That's what got her in so much trouble. What? What do you mean? Exactly what it sounds like. The things that happened, the dark shit. She had a part to play in that, too. You're blaming her for being raped? No, just the rapes. No, I'm not blaming her. I'm trying to tell you who she was and how it contributed to everything that happened. Don't bust my balls, okay? I'm not one of those evil men who thinks women who get raped were asking for it. I don't ask the stupid fucking questions about what they were wearing or if they were dancing sexually or shit like that. I'm not some goddamn Neanderthal. All I'm saying is Julie saw the world through these rose-colored glasses. I don't know if that was because of her upbringing or what. Like, she had to counterbalance everything that made her feel like shit about herself. But everyone, everyone got the benefit of the doubt with her. Didn't matter who it was or what track record they had. Julie always allowed everyone to start with a clean slate. And that was a problem. Why? You went to college. And? Then you know what guys can be like. Yeah, sure. Most guys are good guys. But I'm being completely honest here, Miss Johnson. Even the good guys have some fucked up shit going on in their heads, especially at that age. And it doesn't take much for them to convince themselves that what they do and think is justified. Are we still talking about when she was raped? Or are we talking about when you assaulted her? I made my peace with that. Did you, Lee? We were kids, Miss Johnson. I was fucking stupid. Clueless, okay? And I'm not about to excuse myself because I was wasted. 
believe it or not, I have some insight. <laughs> I was so clueless. I didn't know I did anything wrong until months later. And we'd already been dating when it happened. And it was months later when she told me how it... How I made her feel. I didn't know. I swear it. I didn't understand. I... We were just fooling around. It was an exciting time. We were young. She was hot. And life was all about the moment. I... I didn't even think about it. I didn't even think touching her like that in front of people was wrong, you know? That's how fucking clueless I was. She forgave you, and you two moved on? Just like that? Yes. Well, no, it wasn't just like that. There was a lot of talking and crying and apologizing first. I did a lot of self-examination. But only after Julie opened my eyes. She was... amazing, Miss Johnson. Absolutely amazing. I'd shamed her, but she didn't shame me when she explained why what I did was so fucked up. She helped me. But yeah, we did. We moved on. She accepted her part in it too, and... You know... The thing about her... One of the things I really loved, she didn't need to assign blame to people. I'm not just talking about me and what happened between us, but... Everyone, with everyone, she was like that. This is what you did, and this is how it affected me, was how she rolled. She didn't have a problem confronting people, even in uncomfortable, awkward situations, but... Fuck, did she get herself into some bad shit from time to time. For some reason, I get the feeling you're talking about more than the assaults. I'm getting to it. Okay. Sorry. People walked on her. All the time. Used her for class prep. Used her as a designated driver, whatever they needed. They knew they could go to Julie because she'd come through. She always did because she always believed in people's goodness. When you like that, people are going to figure you out pretty quickly. And people did? Oh yeah, of course they did. The world is full of assholes. And Syracuse is no different. Paying more for school doesn't make anyone immune to being exposed to that kind of shit. People used her all the time. Guys, girls, in between, it didn't matter. People are people, and people are selfish. If they think they can get something out of someone that'll get them ahead, they'll do it. If they think it'll benefit them and they're getting it for free off the back of someone else's kindness, they'll do it. People pretend that they wouldn't. But people have huge blind spots about their own behaviors. Same shit happened to her. People used her. Kindness? Um, not, not really the word I'm looking for. Uh, naivete. They used her naivete against her. All the fucking time. And guys are the worst. Especially when they're in their 20s and they got so many goddamn hormones raging through them. They can't see straight sometimes. Is it true she never told her mother about everything that happened back there? Angela? Oh, no, no, no way she was going to tell that bitch. Oh, sorry. No way she was telling her about anything. Angela knew about Julie's grades and job prospects, and that's about it. And that's the way Julie wanted it. Angela never knew about the assaults. None of them. Not, not that I know of, and she sure as hell didn't know Julie ever got pregnant. She knows, Caleb. Angela told me so herself. She knows about one of the rapes, at least. I'm not sure how, but she knows. God, Angela knows. Shit, that's bad. How so? I, I don't know. Just, they were a small family. Didn't have much going for them. Didn't have a lot of family in the area. They really just had their jobs and their friend circles from those jobs, and that was about it. And it wasn't much, trust me. Angela had her church family, too, but I don't know if Walter ever went. Anyways, Angela is a worn-out shoestring away from losing it. I've spoken with her a few times. She's not my favorite person in the world, but I wouldn't go so far as to say that she was a danger to herself or other people. That's because you don't know her. She's pretty... 
probably the most dangerous person Julie knew. Well, second most, probably. There's always Stanford. Now, you can spend a week with Angela, hell, a month, and you'll still walk away telling me how wrong I am, but I swear, it doesn't last. It can't last. Not the act that she puts on. So she's faking it for me. Isn't that what people do? Everyone's faking it, Miss Johnson. Everyone. How do I know you're not faking it now? For what reason? You know about me, warts and all. I know what you've told me. And Rachel? Angela? Walter? Even the journal Julie kept. Trust me. You know me, and I know your intuition is telling you that something's up with Angela. That she's not right in the head. And that's all I'm saying, because I'm a businessman, not a doctor. And not in the least bit interested in trying to figure out what in the fuck that woman's deal is. But I can tell you, it would have been bad if Angela ever found out about anything that happened to Julie. I mean, come on. You must have read the articles that were written about her after they found her. Do you honestly think that slant was created by a bunch of journalists? Hardly. Some of that shit came from other sources. Like Angela? Like Angela. She was, is, a vindictive woman, a horrible human, if you ask me. But I am the polar opposite of Julie. I don't tend to see the good in people. I tend to see them as they really are, the part they're trying to hide, and I pegged Angela from the get-go. Well, I don't know her like you do. I've seen and heard some ugly things from her, and I'm starting to get a sense of why Julie wasn't always forthcoming with everything. She couldn't be. Not with her mother. <laughs> the funny thing is, Angela thinks very highly of you. <laughs> Remember what I just said about people being fake? Well, who's got two thumbs and knows how to play on a mother's heartstrings? This guy. Mm, such a charmer. All guys do it. All? Yeah. Some are just better than others. But if you want to get into a woman's pants, you've got to go through her mother. That's disgusting. <sighs> Doesn't make it untrue. Her saying that about me just proves I haven't lost my touch. Or that you're a good actor. I guess. So, how do I know you're not acting for me right now? I guess you don't. So convince me. How? Tell me how you killed her. Tell me how you think you killed Julie. Be sure to tune in in two weeks from now for the sixth installment of Julie's story when Caleb shares the darkest revelation about Julie to date. Something, at the time, I couldn't be sure even Rachel knew about. And I'm pretty damn sure Angela definitely didn't know. You've been listening to Who Killed Julie. I'm Emerald Johnson. Thank you for listening, and, as always, keep questioning. If you're enjoying Who Killed Julie, please support the show by becoming a patron. The only way the follow-on to this story gets done is with your support. Head over to patreon.com forward slash Paul Sading to support the show today. Thank you. Who Killed Julie is written and edited by Paul Sading. You can find more about me and my books and other audio drama podcasts, my writing podcast, over at paulsading.com. It is produced and sound designed by the excellent Dog and Pony Studios in Las Vegas, Nevada. They are also the company that produced the second season of Subject Found. You can find them at dogandponystudios.net. Emerald Johnson was played by the one and only, the absolutely wonderful and highly talented audiobook narrator, Ashley Litzy. You can find more about Ashley, her work, and her services over at deepcurvesahead.com. Angela Morrison was Robin Siegerman. You can find Robin and her books over at robinsegerman.com. Rachel Leonard is the one and only Rihanna McAfee. You can find her on twitter.com forward slash re McAfee. John McLean of Dog and Pony Studios played Walter McLemore. You can find him at dogandponystudios.net. Christopher Rocco, Olympia-based actor, played Caleb Haskins. You can find Caleb's live performances by checking out the schedule at oletheater.com. And Lauren Wisniewski played the customer in episode two. 
She's a wonderful voice actor who you can find at lawofalltrades.wordpress.com. I want to give a special thanks to Amy Joy Hilt, who beta read for this podcast, volunteered her services, and really helped me tweak it to make sure that it was ready and appropriate for the material. Amy is a teacher in England and sometimes writer, and I want to thank Amy for her help. This show wouldn't have been what it is without her. If you want to find more about my stories, if you want exclusive stories, if you want insights, special posts, live messaging, early and exclusive access, stories that no one else is going to hear, and you really like what I'm doing with Who Killed Julie, you want to see the second part of this series happen, become a patron. Go over to patreon.com forward slash Paul Sading, pick a reward level that works for your budget and the exclusives that you want, and help me start funding the next show in this series. You can also find this show, paulsading.com forward slash who dash killed dash Julie, where you can find all of the wonderful actor bios. It's on Libsyn, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Google Play. The show is also on Facebook and Twitter, as am I. You can find me at Paul Sading or at Who Killed Julie. The artwork is done by the wonderful Kessie Rolinicki, who does all of my book covers and podcast covers. And of course, that music that is absolutely perfect for this show was done by none other than John Eric de Guzman of Dog and Pony Studios. Thank you for your download and your listen. Please tell a friend about the show. Please help us spread this important message, this important story, Julie's story, the story of us. Music in these credits is provided by Richard Temple.